Today I want to talk about defining vocational identity. My topic is based on my reflections on Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Biblical students know that Isaiah has 66 chapters and is divided into Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, and Trito Isaiah. Chapter 1 through 39 is Isaiah, and then chapters 40 through 54 is Deutero Isaiah, and Trito Isaiah is chapters 55 through 66. I would like to deal with the first part of Isaiah dealing with the call of Isaiah. The call of Isaiah took place in a crisis situation. The admired and respected King of Zad died, leaving the nation in a seemingly hopeless position. Very few kings had been as successful and appreciated as Uzziah. Uzziah had protected the nation against their enemies and the country enjoyed great prosperity. Many citizens had known no other king but him. Uzziah began his reign when he was 16 years old and he reigned for 52 years. It was the year when things fell apart and when the foundations were shaken. Isaiah, the planner, builder, and strong military leader who had won victories over neighboring nations. However, his life ended tragically because when he became strong, his heart was so proud he acted corruptly and was unfaithful to God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar. In response to his burning incense, that only the consecrated sons of Aaron had a right to do, he was inflicted with leprosy and died a leper. This time of disillusionment and discouragement was the occasion for the call of Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah was three-dimensional. First, Isaiah said that in the year that Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up and exalted with the train of his robe, filling the temple. The vision that he had of God was that of an Eastern king attended by seraphim as his ministers of state. Secondly, and with a robe with a flowing train that filled the temple, the train alludes to the majesty, dignity, honor, and power of God. God sitting not on a chair, but on a throne which is elevated high and lifted up. Uzziah no longer sits on his throne, but in his lamentation over the death of Uzziah, as there so God as the eternal sovereign, still in charge of the universe. As there first saw the Lord, then secondly, he saw himself. He heard God's call to prophetic service. And he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying unto me, who will go for us? Isaiah responded with a personal commitment to the God who calls and sins. God is the God who calls and sins. 
He called Abraham and Jonah by name, but Isaiah did not hear his name called. He did hear the Lord say, who will go for us? So Isaiah volunteers without asking God's questions about the expectations of the call or his ability to do the job as did Moses. Without hesitation, Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. The holy angels called seraphim a burning ones surrounding the throne appeared as burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth. According to prophet Ezekiel, the fire was bright and the, out of the fire went lightning. The text says that each of the seraphim had six wings, two wings to cover the face to show that they are not powerful enough to gaze into the face of God. The next two wings covered the feet to hide the humble areas of the body in the presence of a holy God. The last two wings cheerfully and obediently perform duties given to them by God. Calvin said that God's brightness is so much that we cannot endure it if we attempt to gaze upon the radiance of God's brightness is like looking into the sun. Charles Spurgeon said, the angels have four wings for humble reverence and holy awe, and two to serve God. Isaiah said that the seraphims cried out one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth, the whole earth is full of his glory. To say that three times to, means that God is holy in the highest degree. This God is not the God of human sociological or philosophical construction. This God is not a domesticated God of American nationalism capitalism or exceptionalism who congratulates us for our greed, ethnocentrism, and prosperity praise religion. This holy God we encounter is not a God who protects us, the good people from our enemies, the bad people, but being in the presence of God we come to see our true selves and hear the invitation to repentance and a radical orientation of our individual priorities. The radical foundation of the temple shakes at the sound of the voice of God and the temple is filled with smoke. The smoke allegorically represents the presence of God. After God encountered Isaiah, there was the encounter that Isaiah had with himself. First, he saw God in holiness, and secondly, he saw himself. He said, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm undone because I'm a person of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the King infinite in glory without beginning or ending. 
the God that there's no second to compare to without beginning or ending, who forever lives in the unapproachable light of human intellect. The seraphim brings from the altar tongues with a live coal and cleanses Isaiah's lips. His sin is forgiven. His life is cleansed for godly service. Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw himself. And thirdly, Isaiah heard the call from God and responded, saying, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Why, God, do you ask the question? Is it because your plan is to reach the world and to reach the world not through seraphim or robots, but through persons? Listen to the wording of the question, Whom shall I sin? Who is the one who calls and sins? And who is the one who will go for us? No two of you will have the same experience, which may come when you are not looking for it and when you are not ready for it. Looking for it often like Moses, some may respond to the call with denial, rejection, or running from it like Jonah, or trying to negotiate a first step in answering the call of Jesus, which is the discipline of discipleship. In Matthew eleven eight twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In obedience to the Lordship of Jesus, you enroll in seminary for the discipline of serious study and critical reflection in order to avoid spiritual malpractice and to begin the lifelong studious process to become the best possible followers of Jesus Christ. This action avoids responding to the call of God upon your life with an apathetic response or a crippling do-nothingism in the rocking chair of lazy religion. In defining your vocational identity, I ask that you ask yourself, who am I? What shall I be and what shall am I? What shall I do? Am I a slave to hedonistic materialism to satisfy my infantile needs? Or am I a slave of conspicuous consumption which bankrupts personal, national, and world economies with staggering debt? Am I a slave who supports the politics of jingo military defense that spends money indiscriminately to wage wars to subdue the perceived enemies of the nation? Am I a slave to the man my own business silence that refuses to condemn the gangster mentality that perpetrates drive-by shootings, the sale of drugs in my neighborhood, and the devaluation of the bodies of women by rap artists? What shall I be and what shall I do? I will be a vocal advocate for God as my vocation in my church, in my school, in my workplace, and city where religion is a ritual 
and not a way of life. My vocation is being a courageous voice that speaks up for the immigrant stranger, the hungry and the homeless, and the hurting in my city. My vocation is to love mercy, do justly, and to walk humbly with God. Martin Luther King Jr. was influenced by Isaiah, who shaped his vocational identity. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 58, and Isaiah 61 are foundational for his understanding of God, the verbal content of his voice, and the clarity of his vocational identity. Listen to Dr. King as he says, I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to give my life for the hungry. I choose to give my life for those who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. This is the way I'm going. If it means suffering a little bit, I'm going that way. If it means dying for them, I'm going that way. Amen. Because I heard a voice saying, do something for others. Have you heard that voice? I'm sure you have. That's why you are at a blade today. I would ask you to join me, Sister Addie, and the Oblate faculty, and the speakers that you have heard, in answering that call, saying, Here am I, Lord, send me. Dr. King believed in an eschatology, or a moral vision of a beloved community for a planetary living where the lamb and the lion would lie down together in peace due to our faith in the power of God to ultimately triumph over evil, concluding that our radical action for societal change requires from us subversive hope and subversive joy in the presence of legitimized state-sponsored criminalization of the underclass, political unresponsiveness, and global despair and hopelessness. I'm calling on us yeah. to be the alternative to the so-called religious right the so-called evangelical group that's nothing but bad news. The gospel is good news for a bad news world. Woo! I challenge you Woo! to hear the voice of the Lord and to say, Hear my Lord in me. Amen. Amen.